So we thank you, Lord, for these psalms. We thank you for the gift of worship across centuries, across millennia. Uh, and your spirit is the same. And we can echo those words. And we have our spirits lifted up and can mean them so uh, confidently to you, Lord. Holy Spirit, being your word alive, once again we pray this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, so Psalm 46, and uh, whereas the earlier psalm we looked at was the psalmist in, in trouble and literally having to be intentional and deliberate in his worship, here it's the opposite spirit, it's an exuberant uh, an exuberant theme, worship is just pouring out of the psalmist uh, again most likely because of an incident that has happened but we don't know what that incident is okay. so uh, one of the most plausible suggestions that the scholars have felt is when Jerusalem was delivered under Hezekiah when Sennacherib of Assyria had come to attack Jerusalem and laid, it, laid siege to it then Isaiah even came and said prophesied that nothing would happen and then there was a mighty victory for Jerusalem without them even having to fight okay? but that is speculation because people don't really know there is nothing written over here as to why the psalmist has written this that it could be this it could be other victories other things God has done as we go along we'll see some hints hints of that but really the overall picture if we don't think about anything historical is uh, the psalmist just praising God for how awesome God is and therefore how do we respond to who God is and to what God has done and we'll see in verse 10 one of the most famous verses in the Psalms. Okay. So there are three stanzas in this Psalm once again. And we'll take it stanza by stanza. The first stanza is verses 1 to 3. It says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. And the reason why people believe there are three stanzas is after each of these stanzas comes the words Sela or Sila. Okay. So in the first stanza, the psalmist is looking at who God is and connecting that to natural events that are terrifying. Okay. So he starts with who God is. Who is God to us? God is our refuge. He is our strength an ever-present help in trouble. Okay. So I love that beginning because it lays the foundation for everything else. Okay. There has been trouble, there will be trouble, okay. you might be in trouble, but the first thing we do is look to God. Okay. We look to who God is and of course who God is is so often manifested in what He's done for us. To be, it would be, it make no sense saying Uday is so kind if I did not do kind things. But now everyone can say Uday is so kind because you have experienced the kind things that I have done. Okay? So similarly with God, when they say He is our refuge, our strength and ever present help in trouble, it's because they have experienced that. And so can they, they can say that about God. His acts show who He is. Okay? So refuge and strength of course are words that we understand easily. That word ever present help, that word ever present is a very nice phrase. It means that God is exceedingly to be found in trouble. I mean, helping us in trouble. He's exceedingly to be found. You know, it's not just He's always there, He is there so much. Okay, he's so present in those situations. So it emphasizes the speed the completeness and the might of God's help. 
not just that God is helping us, but He's exceedingly present to help us. The speed with which He comes, the completeness with which He helps us, and of course the might that is manifested or exercised in order to help us when we are in trouble. And so with that foundation, He starts looking at, first in this stanza, He looks at natural events. He says, because God is all of these things, therefore, we will not fear things that otherwise would be terrifying, not would be, are terrifying. The things are terrifying, but we are not terrified. You see, that is the point. Okay. So often the situation is this, that we are looking for circumstances to be changed, but God changes our response to the circumstances. And so here he describes a really terrifying scene. Though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. Okay, earthquakes, storms, floods, turmoil and turbulence in the natural world, in nature, things that are terrifying and of course especially for uh, ancient cultures, these were the things were, that were most terrifying which is why they turned to worship those things. You know, in all of God was God's was see were, were just uh, invented for everything in nature because these were the things that were terrifying. And so it became a way to, uh, uh, what do you, what's it called? Propitiate, to appease, because they were so terrifying. But the psalmist says, we will not fear, because God, Elohim, is our refuge, our strength, and, and exceedingly to be found to help us in our troubles. So who God is, and therefore, what we will not do, no matter what is happening, no matter this tumultuous picture of oceans and mountains and the earth and all of that happening, he says no problem. Okay? He finishes this stanza and then the word sila or pause. Okay? One commentator says it's as if the psalmist is saying pause and think about it. Think about what you've just said okay? before we go to the next stanza. So after you've thought for a little while, I mean if you imagine what's happening in actual worship, it might be an interlude happening or it might be a complete pause and everybody silent before the psalmist continues with the song. In the second stanza he goes from uh, God with regard to natural events and therefore how we can respond, he goes to God with regard to hostile forces or what people do to you. Okay. Verse 4, There is a the river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall, God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall, he lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. So we don't have to fear natural events, neither do we have to fear hostile forces, enemy camps, enemy forces that have come against us. But he starts with this contrast, you see, there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. He's talked about water in the previous verse, tumultuous, turbulent storm, the surging of the seas, uh, to the extent that you know, the waters are roaring and foaming and mountains are falling into the sea. And then he speaks about this very peaceful picture. There's a river that whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. You know, and the strange thing is this, there was no river in Jerusalem. Okay. Uh, it's a strange fact that Jerusalem is one of the major cities that does not have a river. Okay. Especially in the ancient world, almost every major city had a huge river running through it because that was a, it was the issue of trade, the river and then the sea. So you think of a bunch of major cities, they have rivers running through them and especially in that time because trade was so much by sea and by water. But Jerusalem, up on a mountain, did not have a river. It had one tiny stream it seems and some, they made aqueducts and things like that but it didn't have this major river and yet in the Bible there's so much talk of a river in Jerusalem. Um, a river was prophesied 
was believed that there would be such a river was celebrated there were there were from because, i mean ezekiel 47 talks about this river coming from the altar okay there was no such river obviously at that time uh, in john 7 when we have jesus coming and saying that rivers of living water will flow he is talking about a uh, he is referring to the holy spirit of course but in that context to an to a ceremony that would take place that would depict this river that would one day flow through jerusalem okay of course eden had a river rivers going through it the new jerusalem will have a river an amazing river going through it but there was no actual river in jerusalem so i thought to myself what is this river whose streams make glad the city of god yes he is talking about a river to come okay but when we look at the next verse we realize that the river he is talking about is god's presence and of course even in the river of ezekiel 47 is about the holy spirit is about his presence and i i thought it was so amazing i feel what what the psalmist is saying is yeah every other city has a river we've got this amazing river the very presence of god coming from the holy of holies the holy place okay this is the city of god this is the holy place where the most high dwells and therefore there's a river befitting this place the city of god the place where the most high dwells and we look at the next verse and we see that coming so clearly god is within her see there's a river that makes glad the city of god god is within her okay his presence in the holy of holies and therefore among his people and because god is within her again that no big uh, in in verse in the beginning in the first stanza it was god is x y z therefore we will not fear again here god is within her she will not fall okay and it's not just protection it is immediate protection god will help her at the break of day at the beginning of the day at dawn itself he will not uh, hesitate he will not wait okay because god is within her because his presence is here that is the river that is so special for jerusalem and then verse 6 talks about a different kind of turmoil the earlier turmoil was natural here the turmoil is about nations and kingdoms and armies nations are in uproar kingdoms fall he lifts his voice <coughs> the earth melts what is he saying here he is saying here see nations are in uproar really means nations are roaring nations are raging there's a voice coming out of the nations okay like for example assyria if we take the example of senachar cherub in assyria he was conquering kingdom after kingdom after kingdom and it was like the roar of the armies and kingdoms were the word of for fall is actually tottering kingdoms were tottering at this roar that was coming from the nations and that is a terrifying enough picture but when the lord lifts his voice the earth melts you see the contrast yes kingdoms totter but here the earth literally dissolves when the lord just lifts his voice he is trying to say that this is how awesome our god is okay and therefore we do not need to fear the nations the roar of the nations the roar of the armies okay especially in ancient times there was when armies fought there was uh, real noise because it was i mean all that clattering of chariots and this and that and people screaming and shouting and the trumpets blowing a very noisy affair and sometimes that noise itself was terrifying and then verse 7 is actually a refrain it's written differently and it could be that it's a response to you know if if they were worshiping one person said this and then the chorus the choir said this verse 7 the lord almighty is with us the god of jacob is our fortress and that word lord almighty is yahweh sabaoth the lord of hosts or the lord of the angel armies he is with us and the god of jacob is our fortress i love those two words of course he is with us and therefore he is our fortress 
his presence gives us protection okay uh, yahweh sabaoth gives us that sense of god's power and god of jacob gives us that sense of covenant love okay but look at the look at the contrast there if you're talking about the power and love of god okay see how beautifully the psalmist has written this this verse yahweh sabaoth who is almighty god is with us covenant you see presence god of jacob which talks of covenant love is our fortress which talks of power and it brings together those two aspects of god's love and power always intermingled together his covenant love and his awesome power always being manifested and released on behalf of his people again sila again pause think about this we we don't we don't have to fear natural events no matter how terrifying they are we don't have to fear the roaring and the raging of nations no matter how powerful they are okay because god is with us his presence is with us and then it goes to the third stanza from verse 8 okay and there's a shift here from from extolling god proclaiming how awesome he is it's an invitation he says come come and see the works of the lord the desolations he has brought on the earth he makes war cease to the end of the earth he breaks the bow and shatters the spear he burns the shields with fire okay that is the invitation to see what god has done he has been describing who god is he has been talking so much about god he says you come and see for yourself the his works and in the in the in this particular context his the desolation or the devastation he has visited on an army which is why people believe that something must have actually happened and the psalmist in that point is saying come and see for yourself okay now if it refers to this actual event i'm just reading one verse which gives you an idea what he is asking us to come and see or was asking them to come and see somebody to come and see at that time do of course it could be just figurative and uh, uh, lyrical sort of come and see in the sense of come and see from scripture for example this is what he did in exodus this is this is what he did to the egyptians this is what this is what he did to the assyrians this is what he did to the midianites it could be even that way okay but if you but if you think about an actual physical description 2 kings 19 verse 35 i'll just read that one verse out that night the angel of the lord went out and put to death 185000 men in the assyrian camp when the people got up the next morning there were all the dead bodies so you can imagine if when they actually if he actually saw the sight what a sight it must have been 185000 dead bodies they've not even they've not lifted a finger they haven't gone into battle okay in jehoshaphat's story they actually, they at least had to go and stand in the place of battle in the case of hezekiah they're still hiding in the city and all this happens outside okay so you can think about that that the dead bodies you would have seen bows and spears and shields all lying all over the place okay so his point is i'm not just i'm not just speaking in a vacuum come and see for yourself come and experience for yourself our awesome god and the things he does yeah so if if it was an actual event like this you can imagine the scene but more than that it's a psalm is saying that come and see come and see for yourself come and experience it for yourself either it was something physical that they were seeing or you could just go through so many stories of all that god had done in the past and know that god is an awesome god and then of course verse 10 therefore how do we respond and suddenly hear the 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 voice shifts and it's god speaking suddenly i just love it when that happens you know here the psalmist is speaking of course until verse 9 it's the psalmist speaking and it's the outpouring of praise from him and suddenly it shifts to a prophetic voice okay in the first person and it's god speaking now and god said be still and know that i am god 
I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Okay, and so God speaks and he says, be still. Now the best uh, synonym for this word, be still, in this particular context, another, you know, be still can be be calm, be peaceful. This be still actually means relax. Okay, the the literal word is to sink, to sink down like, you know, just relax your body. Okay, so be still and know that I am God. Okay, let there be this constant awareness, perception of me. And not of me means what, of who I am and of what I do. Okay, I say what I do because what I have done, what I will do, whatever, what I do, who I am and what I do. Okay. Be still and know that I am God. We need to know so that we will act upon that knowledge. Okay. In this case, by actually being still. Okay. If you are not aware of who God is, if you are not just, if it's not in the, you know, just like yesterday we said, intentionally, he chose to worship. Intentionally we bring to the forefront of our minds who God is and to know Him and then we will act upon it. In this case acting upon it who God is and what He has done is to be still. And and one, and if we, if we focus on who God is, what He has done, okay, know that He is God, then what will come forth is awe, reverence, you know, faith, surrender, all these things will really bring us into a place of what we consider stillness. Not getting agitated, not getting stressed, not uh, getting frantic to solve whatever the problem is, or even say depressed, that we cannot solve the problem. He says, be still and know that I am God. And the psalmist can say this because he has given such uh, vivid descriptions of how, of very difficult things, whether it is natural events or hostile forces. Okay, so you say if, if, if in all of that we can say be still, what problem is there of yours? That we cannot be just be still and know that God is God. And then there is actually a future thing. Until now it is what God has done and then there is a future aspect to it. I will be exalted among the nations, I will be exalted in the earth because when things are wrong, we are wondering where is God, what is He up to, it seems that He is defeated but God says, I will be exalted. Okay. You just have to be still. It reminds you of Philippians 2 where for Jesus also, it's a future thing, no? Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's already been lifted up to the highest place by the way. He's already seated next to God and the, the Father in the heavens. But yet, there is still a time to come when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And it's a similar picture here. I will be exalted. I will be exalted among the nations and in the earth. And especially when everything seems impossible, God is saying, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted. And then again comes the refrain. Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord Almighty, the God of the angel armies is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. That beautiful picture of his covenant love and his awesome power all being worked out, manifested on our behalf. Holy Spirit, invite you to come this morning we stir our hearts with a confidence in who our God is and what he has done and what he will do or what you are doing even right now Lord, we want to open our hands, our hearts, our spirits 
and ask you to come and do a work in us that we may truly be still and know that you are God. In Jesus' name, Amen.